Thank you for joining us today for Meeting Facilitation Skills, a webinar for AmeriCorps VISTA leaders. I'm your host, Bethany DuSablin, a Senior Learning Advisor at Education Northwest, one of AmeriCorps' partners. I'm delighted to introduce our main speaker for today's webinar, Mike Beebe. Mike is an independent trainer and facilitator with Leadership for Change Training and Consulting. Mike has over three decades of experience providing leadership development training, both as a nonprofit program director and as an external consultant. Mike is passionate about anti-poverty work and has a long history with national service dating back to the 90s when he directed Just Serve AmeriCorps, a youth anti-violence program in Seattle, Washington. Additionally, Mike has been a trusted trainer for the AmeriCorps VISTA program since 2005. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Bethany. I'm happy to be here. Thanks as well for that introduction. I also have had the great honor of both supervising VISTA members and leaders in my work here in Seattle running youth leadership programs. So I'm so glad to be invited today to discuss meeting facilitation. Facilitation skills are so critical for all of us to be effective engaging people from diverse backgrounds with diverse ideas to engage in meaningful conversation and ultimately to get things done together to achieve our collective vision of ending poverty. First, let's start with an overview of what we'll cover in this session. First, we'll talk about what we mean by meeting facilitation and the role an effective facilitator plays in a meeting. Then we'll identify a few fundamental skills of a facilitator, including remaining content neutral, being an active listener, and asking good questions. And finally, we'll explore the experiential learning cycle as a tool for putting those fundamental skills into practice. You'll have a chance to break out in small groups to brainstorm ideas and address a common meeting challenge. With that, let's get started. Okay, we're gonna start with, why do we have meetings? Before the session started, and as you uh, started logging in, you answered the question in the chat, what meetings have you recently attended? I know I saw some people are attending some weekly staff meetings. I'm really curious to hear more about this storytelling uh, workshop that some folks attended. Would love to go to that. What brought you together? Sometimes meetings are about disseminating, disseminating information, but other times a meeting brings people together for a purpose to reach a specific outcome. Outcomes could include a few things. I'm noting you all are gathering together to learn about storytelling. Um, there could include decision making, brainstorming, project planning, all of which require input from people. Effective meetings are clear about their overarching purpose for coming together, have clear outcomes, and an agenda that is designed to meet this outcome. Today, we are going to focus on facilitating the process when you're in a meeting rather than planning an agenda and how this process helps you meet your outcomes. Quick tip though, before we jump into that, is when planning your meeting, you'll want to define the purpose, you know, the why it's important to meet outcomes, what do, you, what do we most need to accomplish, and process, how will we accomplish those outcomes. You want to pop for shorthand, you want to pop it before you get into the room. One of your key roles is to help keep the group on track. To do that, you need to have a clear idea where you're heading, POP is a planning tool for any meeting to get clear on your purpose and outcomes for coming together before creating your agenda. We're gonna start with some foundational information about facilitation and key roles of a facilitator. To get us started, I'd like to hear what you think facilitation is about. We have an activity for you and Bethany is going to explain. Thanks, Mike. Um, as Mike said, we're gonna start this talk about, topic by hearing from you. Because we're, taking, we're talking about facilitating, including facilitating online, we're giving you the option to share your responses verbally or by typing in the chat. To share verbally, please select the hand, raise hand button and I'll call on you at that point and you can unmute yourself and share your responses verbally. And that's mainly so you're not, um, people aren't talking over each other. We're giving each other an, uh, the, the floor. Um, and this is a little different than how we usually do things, but we wanted to give this as an option to align very well with this topic. So if you want to respond in the chat, type your answer and select everyone before you submit so everyone can see. Um, I find, and I know Mike finds one of the biggest challenges of meeting facilitation is that folks don't understand what it means to be a facilitator. So let's hear from you, what is facilitation or what is one role of a facilitator?
Okay, we've got keep the meeting on track. Yeah, David and Linda both said that. Making things easier to keep things moving. Managing the meeting. Facilitator is the person who keeps the meeting or process running smoothly. Setting the tone for the group. Leading and guiding the meeting. Really good answers. Any, any more? Manages conflict. Aha. Keeping people on time. Conducting the meeting. Great. Awesome. All right. What do you think, Mike? What are you seeing and hearing here? Yes. Uh, well, definitely seeing some themes around conducting, keeping the process moving along. Oh, I like David just commented listening. Appreciate that that's coming up. We might just cover that. Um, it's conflict. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's definitely we're there to help manage the conflict. Setting the tone, lots of uh, lots of good stuff. I mean, it does seem sound like you already have a pretty good sense of what facilitation is and what the role um, facilitators take on. And um, then I'm just seeing some more great contributions come in. Facilitation to me is being the person who manages the operational functions of meeting, allows folks to contribute and be heard and stay on track towards shared goals. Okay, Dante, you want to join me as a presenter? <laughs> that was great. Let's uh, let's move on. We want to dive into some of what you're raising in the chat. I'm glad to see that um, see that you, you seem to have a pretty good sense of the roles. Let's see here. So the word facilitate actually went broken down to its Latin roots. I don't know if we've got any study of word geeks in the room. I am one. It actually means to make easy. A strong facilitator makes it easier for all voices to be heard. And if facilitation is done well, we are thoughtfully engaging folks across race, class, gender, sexual orientation, ability, and other identities. Facilitation done well is a tool for equity. Facilitation also is a way of providing leadership and direction without taking control. An effective facilitator provides a process to help a group make high quality decisions towards objectives and goals. A facilitator bridges ideas and perspectives to help a group work together effectively. And flip side it too, that is that facilitators help groups assume responsibility for their own actions and decisions. I wanna go back to you now to get more ideas on what a facilitator does. Bethany will explain. Okay, you did great on that one. But now that we have a working definition, we want to make sure we're clear on what a facilitator does. And for this question, um, please answer by selecting the raise hand button, as you know, to respond verbally or to just put in the chat. So we're going to have kind of a compare and contrast kind of situation here. So what's the difference between a facilitator and presenter? Let's see what people think about that. Y'all can talk too. Be able to unmute and share your response. Okay, I see engagement with the audience. Presenter just provides the information. They do not direct the meeting. Um, I was about to say, uh, facilitation is less about like the like the exact content of what you're like trying to speak, as much as like uh, contributing to how other people share that, like their contributions um, in content. Thank you, Dante. Uh, yes, appreciate that. Facilitator manages flow of the meeting, presenter shares on topic. Again, welcome other voices in the room too, as well as the chat. Yep, okay. And so what about the difference between a facilitator and a teacher? I still see some coming in around the presenter, which yep, is great. from the previous, yep. yeah. And then Linda says, the previous kind of... answer. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other nuances there, folks? When we change up the the teacher, teacher and facilitator? One guides the audience through the process while the other shares information and content. Okay. All right, and finally, let's let's do the final one, which is what's the difference between a facilitator and a trainer? Oh, I see teacher educates in some way, some other answers coming in there, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, 
What stands out to you? Ooh, here's a new one. The difference between to, Go ahead. Go ahead. To, con uh, to concept is the following. The facilitator provides safe space and the presenter is the most for more formal and share information. All right, so it's that sharing information yeah. comes through. Seems like the comments are slowing down. Yep. Yeah. All right. Oh, here we go. Here, similar like to this teacher, creates but... opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it keeps me moving along, creates opportunities for group contributions while trainer presents the topic and teaches the audience about it. Okay. Yeah, audience gets to teach themselves or train themselves. Uh, Trainer is similar to a teacher, but coaches people to help understand the information. Okay. Yeah, Lin right. Linda, you have your hand raised. Let's hear from you. Sure. Hi. So um, I guess, yeah, I guess the question is between the uh, the teacher and the trainer and then the facilitator, right? So at least I would think the difference between the trainer and the teacher is that shorter term goal as a trainer, right? Very specific. That would be my interpretation. And so mm -hmm. then what is then the difference between that and the facilitator? Once again, I guess I get back to the facilitator does not have to be the subject matter expert. So those are yeah. my thoughts um, on that. But it helps. I mean, certainly it helps if, if it's a subject that they're passionate about. But again, I like the fact that you're bringing out the, the fact that they are uh, uh, they're non judgmental. They're, they're not taking over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Huh. Good. So there's me are always more, more of an MC, someone who provides support. All right. Interesting. Yeah, Linda, to your comment, last week I was facilitating a two-day retreat with folks who are all trying to um, working on providing dental care to low-income communities across the state of Washington. And I really could know not, I would really be the worst person to talk to about um, how to do that and also about dental care in general. Um, so it, it's <laughs> interesting. You don't need to be a subject matter expert, as a number of people said. Um, well, you might think about as we, this is good. It seems like you have a pretty good notion of the difference between a facilitator and these other roles um, and know that uh, this is where people get confused. So I just want to put that out there. Think about what I'm, what am I today? You can throw that in the chat while you're at it, but I also want to move us along. Uh, so the key difference, just I want to point out a key difference. And when you are facilitating, you're there for the group and your main person purpose, as a lot of you suggested, is to invite in their wisdom, not share yours. All the other roles, while you might take a facilitative approach to it, teachers, trainers, and presenters, they're expected to share their wisdom. And I was glad to see that that really did show up in the uh, in your responses. So it seems like you're getting it. So now we've differentiated between a facilitator and a presenter or, or trainer or teacher. Let's get clear about what a facilitator does and does not do. So an, effect, an effective facilitator does not take part in the discussion. Rather, does assume the group has experience and wisdom and draws that wisdom from the group. An, effect, an effective facilitator does not try to influence the outcome, rather does help the group move forward by surfacing their ideas to help move them forward towards the group's desired outcomes. And an effective facilitator does not offer their own views, rather seeks the views of the group members. An effective facilitator does not make decisions rather does rely on the group's ability to offer up and reach their own decisions. And finally, an effective facilitator does not take control of the content, but rather guides the process. So very consistent with what you said. So let's, uh, let's focus in on a few fundamental sk skills of facilitation. We've already touched on a couple in our definition of facilitation and the roles of the facilitator, but we'll get into more detail here. Fundamental skills of effective facilitation we're gonna to cover today are staying content neutral, active listening and asking good questions. So first we're, look, we're going to look at staying content neutral and what that looks like in the context of facilitation. 
Earlier, we talked about what a facilitator does and does not do. A facilitator invites the participation and wisdom of the group, but should not share their own wisdom. A facilitator is there to support the group in meeting their outcomes. We also know that you as VISTA members and as people who care about creating a more just world, we aren't neutral about work that helps us achieve our aims of ending poverty and creating healthier, more just communities. So remaining content neutral involves using neutral verbal language responses that affirm folks' answers without showing a preference for one response over another's. An example of a non-neutral answer would be, oh, I like that idea, or good answer. Actually, you should refrain from using those types of phrases. The alternative that I suggest is, thank you for your thoughts. You see that on the screen there, or simply thank you. Next, pay attention to your body language and try to use neutral body language. Try to keep an bo open body stance both in person and online. Watch, for example, I don't know if you can see in the screen there, watch, for example, um, close, uh, put it, watch, for example, closing your arms over your chest there and because uh, that can communicate a closed. Also might mean you're cold, but I also can send a message that I'm closing off. Also make eye contact with everyone, not just people that you're feeling more drawn to. During online meetings, I recommend holding a fidget toy or worry stone that just helps to help with anxiety and inclination to multitask and helps you pay attention to those in the meeting. Next, check your opinions. When you're facilitating is not the time to share your opinions. It's your time to ask the group for theirs. And finally, you lead the process, not the content. Again, you're moving the group towards their outcomes, not generating the content of the meeting. Okay, we're next gonna move to the next fundamental skill, which is active listening. And let's start out by practicing this super important skill of active listening together. I'm gonna share a brief story in two minutes about my favorite place in the world to sit. You're gonna listen. You're for, if your first name starts in the letters A through L, I want you to listen for information and facts. If your first name starts in M to Z, please listen for emotions, spirit, or energy. Just listen quietly, and then when prompted, report back in the chat. Okay, Bethany is gonna ask me to share. Mike, please tell me about your favorite place in the world to sit. Sure, thank you for asking. I do have many, but since I am logged in from home today, I thought I would share a bit about a place in my home. We have a big blue overstuffed chair that sits between a window and our fireplace, and it's very comfortable to sit in. Behind the chair, we have a built-in bookshelf with, with some of my favorite books in it. And beside the chair, I have my New York Times newspapers from the last several months stacked. I love to spend the first 15 minutes or so of each day with my cup of coffee and the New York Times world game that helps my brain wake up. And I also enjoy that most mornings, my daughter will join me in the big blue chair and work on our Duolingo activity of the day. She's learning Norwegian. I also know that my, since my daughter is 11, I might not have much more time before she either won't be able to fit in that chair or simply won't want to. So for now, I treasure that time. Thank you, Mike. Okay, now we'd like to hear from you, those of you with the first names that start with the letter A to L. In the chat, put the res uh, put the factual information that you, you heard. And I'll read those out. So factual information from those with A to L first names. Daughter is 11, that is a fact. <laughs> the, the, describing the chair, um, that you have many favorite places, mentioning the New York Times, the books we have, um, drinks coffee in the morning, so the activities you're doing in that chair. Yeah, excellent. All right, now it's time for, keep keep going with the A to L folks with the, um, the factual information, but we're gonna give some space for the M through Z. What emotions, spirit, energy did you hear? Go ahead and put those into the chat. Emotions, spirit, and energy. Mm 
Yeah, we've got still on the facts, facts so far. So yeah, motion facts are energy. coming. Yeah. Comfortable environment, mm -hmm. treasured time with a loved one. There's lots of um, warm feelings for Mike's daughter. Reminiscing, describing the feeling, a little anxious about kid getting older. I know how that feels. <laughs> Enjoying mm -hmm. having your daughter around, yep. Thank you all. Keep adding, what, do you, what stands out to you, Mike? Uh, one, I'm just appreciating that, you know, folks really did hone in on the facts when we asked that and also really honing in on the emotions. Uh, so, of course, with emotions, it's we're it that's stuff we're interpreting. Right. So we pick up energy, we pick up emotions. And so um, I appreciate where we in in a room together, you might check out. It was interesting to see the anxious one, for example, probably could be picking up some anxiety about Hey, I'm presenting to people across the country online here, <laughs> um, but also the anxiety about them pending uh, time when my daughter won't want to sit in the chair with me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just thank you all. It seems like you were very uh, listening well is what I what stood out to me, Bethany. Uh, the important and challenging role of active listening for a facilitator is you have to listen for facts and emotions of not just one person, but the whole group. And so that can be hard to do as the numbers increase in a room, but both are important, a uh, very important piece of facilitation. So let's look a bit, a little bit closer to active listening and what it entails. As noted in our activity, it is important, but can be challenging to listen for facts and emotions, of not just one person, but the whole group. When we're listening to facts and emotion of the whole group, we're modeling one of the key roles of active listening, and that's be inclusive. Um, Experiment with silent listening. So I got recommendation from a fellow facilitator to pause for eight seconds before speaking again after I'd posed a question and you know refrain from that urge to fill the silence. People often need time to form their thoughts before saying them aloud. So it is really important to give them time. It can feel uncomfortable, but a few seconds of silence, uh, I urge you to, uh, I, but a few seconds of silence can really help. And I urge you to become more comfortable with silence if you're not currently comfortable with it and give it a try. Do that count one to eight. Uh, next um, uh, on the slide here, you'll see scan your group to see what the group energy is like, whether in person or online. And online, of course, scanning is a little different. We're watching the chat and if their camera's on, we're trying to read energy through the little Zoom window. But take note of body language when you can. Do, do people look tired? Are they on their phone? What are their facial expressions? Do they look like they want to say something? Scan your group online or in person throughout your meeting. And finally, a reminder about remaining content neutral. Uh, well, but while active listening is important to acknowledge and affirm when each person shares by thanking them for sharing, also use inclusive body language with an open stance and make eye contact with those speaking. Also, in addition to be inclusive, active listening aims to clarify ideas. We do this in a, in a few ways. First, we might repeat what someone said to be sure everyone heard it or ask someone else in the room to repeat it. We also might paraphrase, repeat back what we heard in our own words. We might summarize to make sure we're capturing themes, experiences, and to close out a topic and move on to another. And finally, we record ideas so we can see them in writing and have a record of what was discussed and, and, and also decided or agreed on. So let's take a brief look at the fundamental facilitation skill of active listening. Or actually, we're going to take a look at asking good questions next. Um, so let's let's look at look at the ability to ask good questions. Uh, perhaps this could be titled asking better questions, as I find I don't always ask the right question at the right time, but with practice, preparation, and training, I do keep making them better. Um, today we're going to focus in on the importance of asking open-ended questions and creating a sequence that helps move a group from surface level conversations to depth. Have you all had the experience of facilitating a meeting and you pose a question, you get met, met with silence or simply a one word answer and then the conversation comes to a halt? Uh, well, that might be because you asked a closed ended question, a question that only requires a yes or no answer. 
that type of question often starts with is, can, how many, does, et cetera. So an example of a closed-ended question is, did the event go well? Do you have any ideas how we can improve the event next time? If we wanna open up the conversation beyond yes or no answers, we need to ask open-ended questions, which often start with what, how, and when. So for example, we change the question, did the event go well, to how did the event go? And do you have any ideas how we can improve the event to what are some ways we could improve the event? And you can see beyond asking open-ended questions to open a conversation, we do this more specifically to explore the facts as well as to explore feelings. You'll see just a few examples here. A great one is tell me more about, like I, earlier I was like, tell me more about that storytelling uh, workshop you were in. Uh, and we have a few others on this slide that can be good go-tos as well. What is the best outcome? can help with a group on the task at hand? What is the least likely? What would X say about this? And finally, a sample on the screen of what we call a magic wand question. Uh, if I use that, it might sound something like this. If you had a magic wand and could wave it and make the community healthier and more just, what would be different because of waving that wand? It's a question I like to use when I'm trying to get groups to envision positive changes in their communities. After open-ended questions have been asked, you may find it much easier then to generate ideas. So speaking of generating ideas, why do facilitators rely heavily on asking open-ended questions? Well, open questions create a space for participants to generate ideas together. The use of open-ended questions provides a place to brainstorm ideas. With brainstorming, we share out anything that comes to mind. No matter how unlikely or unique it is, you'll follow the rule that all ideas are valid. Open-ended questions can encourage the sharing of personal or individual experiences. This can come in the form of people sharing stories and experiences that impact them or can help you see where they're coming from. When people share stories and ideas, it helps to surface similarities and differences. You as a facilitator will be able to listen and take note of similar ideas and, uh, and ideas that are different from each other. We need both. All right, this concludes our discussion about some fundamental skills facilitators should possess. We're going to pause for a moment and check your understanding of what we've talked about so far. All right, we'd like to take a minute to see how well you've been following along. And this is for those of you who've um, attended these webinars, you're used to this. Um, so I'm going to read out a, a scenario and it's on your screen. And then we're going to ask you to respond to a question. So Makeka is a VISTA leader of a multi-site project. Her sponsors bring her team of six members together for a two-day training. And Makeka has been given time to do some team building. She wants to facilitate a process to identify shared values that provide a foundation the team can agree on, agree to. She researches a consensus process to use for the session. To start, Makeka asks an open-ended question. What do we value as a group? She pauses and gets two responses from the group before they go silent. So the question is, and this will pop up in the poll, what is one thing Makeka could do to make this facilitation more effective? So the, the choices here are take the two responses shared and adopt those values for the group. Ask the team follow-up questions to generate more responses. Share a story about the value another team chose and ask people if they want to adopt those. Or should Makeka share her thoughts on what values the team should adopt? So make your selection and select submit. And we'll give you a little bit of time so that everybody can answer. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the poll. Uh, Misty, if you could try to launch the poll, and if not, we could collect responses in the chat. We're, we're seeing the poll. I mean, I'm I seeing already it launched it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on my handset, I, I just don't see it, but I put it in the, I put it in the chat. Awesome. Oh, unless it's in the chat. Maybe the poll's in the chat. Is a link in the chat? We can see um, it's popping up. If you're on a regular yeah. desktop or laptop, it should be popping up right over the Zoom window there. Yeah. Like a pop okay, out. we have we have about half of the people 
Um, we'll give a few more seconds here to answer. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's close this poll and show the correct answer. And wow, this is a this is a smart group. We've got the correct answer is B. Ask the team uh, follow up questions to generate more responses. Yep. So that that's uh, a good next step for Makeka to get um, rather than to um, influence and try to influence what folks want or suggest things that she thinks is a good place to start. So. Awesome, thank you for participating in that. Next, Mike's gonna introduce the experiential learning cycle. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, the experiential learning cycle is a framework we can use to help us craft a sequence of open-ended questions that lead a group from surface to depth. Right, just as I was looking at your question there, it might, might help us, it could really help us have a values conversation, for example. We can help groups learn together better by sequencing questions with the experiential learning cycle in mind. We have a handout that includes this information. There's a link to it in the chat. Now, one of my early, I share an early facilitation experience. One of my early experiences was as a challenge course facilitator also known as a ropes course. I wonder if we have any other folks who've either been on one or um, led one. Uh, you, may, you may have, you may, maybe you have. Uh, yes, Jennifer has, all right. Uh, so when I, when it comes to, when I think back on that time, what comes to mind is I, I remember being up high in the sky on a rope and in a harness and balancing across wood beams or shaky ladder 25 feet or 50 feet up in the air. Well, that was a very fun part of those courses. However, as a facilitator, I found the greatest learning happened on the low ropes course where I would facilitate groups and team building activities where they had to solve problems such as a river crossing or getting through a spider's web. Again, the activity was fun, but the real learning happened during the debrief of the activity. We were taught the experiential learning cycle, you're seeing a visual in front of you now, as a facilitation tool for how to help the group process for the experience and ultimately walk away with key learnings. Let's take a closer look at this cycle. The cycle in term was coined and written about by David Kolb, who believes the best learning happens experientially. And when we understand this cycle, we can help groups learn better together and ultimately make better decisions and take actions on them. When we slow down, and slow down being the operative word, and take in what's happening day to day, we go through experiential learning cycle over and over, as indicated by these arrows. Top right hand corner, you see we start with a, a concrete experience. We reflect as you move, we move moving kind of clockwise here, as, uh, as we reflect on what that experience means to us, what happened, how did it feel, is the reflective piece, we then start to make meaning of, of it through what David calls it abstract conceptualization. And once we have thought about the why behind what happened, we are ready to take action, or as David calls it, active experimentation. Let's see how this translates into a sequence of questions we might ask to help groups move through this cycle. You'll see uh, simple words or a mnemonic device to remind you of the steps of the sequence, which are what, again, starting in that top right hand corner, what, gut, so what, and now what. Let's take a closer look at each of them. During the what phase, participants describe or share their experience, report their observations and reactions to what just happened to the group, find out what events occurred and how each member of the group may have experienced the activity differently. So they might ask, what happened? What did you see? What did you hear? What are phrases or words that you remember hearing? What key, maybe you're looking at a report together, what key pieces of data are in this report? Or simply, what is a moment that you remember? Following along, the, following along on the experiential learning cycle, let's move to the next piece, which is the gut question. With gut, participants get help processing their reactions and feelings that were evoked during the experience. I might ask, what surprised you? Where did you feel most engaged? Where did you feel disengaged? How did it feel when dot, dot, dot? Um, where did you notice it in your body? Uh, when were you excited? When were you hesitant? Uh, what was the experience like for you? Following the gut questions, our next piece of the experiential learning cycle is the so what. 
At So What, participants begin to make sense of their shared experience. The group starts to identify patterns or themes. Participants transfer their personal learning from the experience to the rest of the world. So I might ask at the So What stage, what went on in the group? What kind of patterns are you seeing here? What themes are you noticing? How is that significant? Where have we seen this before? What does this remind you of? What does it help explain? What did, what did you learn or relearn? What, uh, what worked, didn't work? And finally, now it's time to explore the last piece of the experiential learning cycle, which is the now what. At the now what phase, uh, participants begin to plan ways to use what they've learned through this experience at home, school, or work in, in the future. Participants share their learning with each other. I might ask, as you see here, what do you want to remember from this experience in the future? What would you do differently in a similar situation in the future? How could you apply that? How could you hold on to that feeling? What are your options for handling a similar situation back at your site? How can you take this experience and apply it to a situation back home? How could you make it better? I often just ask, what's one takeaway? There's another good one. Uh, now that we've completed all the pieces of the experiential learning cycle, let's use the what and gut to reflect on our own experiences with online meetings. Okay, so we're going to walk through the steps of this next activity just so you have a sense of what's going to happen. And um, Mike is going to facilitate the first steps of the experiential learning, that, that what and gut, and then we'll put you into breakout groups to discuss the next two, uh, the so what and the now what. But first, we're using uh, a shared Jamboard to gather your thoughts. And, and please note that on the Jamboard, that we're going to place that link in the chat, there are two pages to that. The first page of the Jamboard has the what and the gut questions um, that you'll discuss and then and respond to now uh, in this activity. And then the second page has the so what and the now what. Um, and that's so those are the two that you'll answer in your small groups and then take notes in the Jamboard. So we're going to try to um, kind of re record the things you say and have a place for you to put your ideas in um, in real time. Oh, let's, okay. uh, I think people are getting in OK, it looks like I'm glad to see that. Uh, have, have you ever found it challenging to engage people in online meetings? I, I know that I have. So we're, as Bethany said, we're going to use experiential learning cycle to have conversation about online meeting engagement. I'll get us started by asking the questions at the what and gut levels. You will all finish by discussing the so what and now what levels and ultimately coming back with some tips for all of us to improve online meeting engagement. So at the what level, what have you noticed about engagement in recent online meetings? So they're a little different than previous times. Answer verbally or in the Jamboard rather than the chat this time. Verbally or in the Jamboard. A couple of minutes to answer that. What have you noticed about engagement in recent online meetings? I have to do it verbally because I, I I had I'm stuck in my car, so I'm I'm That's parked, great. but I'm using this. So I I've noticed that the breakout rooms work very well. Um, I've noticed that actually doing this is more difficult when you have to type something in, even if you're in front of a laptop. But I have found that the breakout rooms are working very well. Thank you for getting us going on that, Linda. Um, low engagement and replying, I see on the, that's something you noticed. And it says, Elsa, I noticed where the GM board is getting scrambled a bit, which happens. Uh, control Z is undo, I think, if you find you've deleted something accidentally <laughs> or that back arrow button up top. Oh, I see it's getting populated. People are figuring it out. Right. Yeah, and I think sometimes those those the sticky notes kind of pop on top of each other. So you may have to yeah. drag yours off. Yeah. But it looks like people I'm going to start reading some of these off. People disengage very quickly if it's not interactive. Okay, there have been more engagement recently. There has been more engagement recently. Someone's experiencing some uptick on that. If cameras are on, little interaction, um, there's little interaction usually. Um, or sorry, if the cameras are not on, apologize for that. Participants are more engaged in smaller groups. Okay, people like games and activities. Um, a vote for cameras on is best. 
Um, it's easy to zone out if active participation isn't required. Participants get exhausted more quickly than in in-person meetings. Okay. People are turning their cameras on more. Um, engagement exercises, polls, pairs, and shares, et cetera, help people feel more connected. Um, okay, great. There's no sense of community. People won't engage. Okay, good points. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm already noticing folks uh, folks are getting to the tips, so hold on to those too. Uh, but it's good to hear the tips that are helping with engagement. So at the gut level, I uh, want to ask a gut level question before we go into breakout rooms. When have you felt disengaged? Again, answer verbally or in the Jamboard, especially if you can't access the Jamboard. That's a good, good invitation for you to answer verbally. Love hearing your voices as well as um, seeing your responses in the Jamboard too. Okay, we've got when, when Zoom meetings last too long without real meaningful content or connection, or simply when meetings last too long. Yeah, I think we've <laughs> all experienced that. Uh, long lectures um, are disengaging. Long stretches of talking from a single voice without breaks. When I don't understand the topic of discussion. When meetings are led with lack of enthusiasm, too much information when I'm new and invited to a meeting and I do not know anything about, all right. Okay. All right, thank you. great. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, now we're warmed up. Uh, we'll explain how you will discuss the so what and now what levels in smaller groups. Yes, thanks for getting us started, Mike, with the first few steps. Um, so we're gonna put you into breakout groups to continue the process. Um, you'll be randomly assigned to breakout groups of uh, about four to five people. And um, just so that you have the most time possible to discuss, we've got a quick way to assign the role of facilitator and note taker. The person whose first name with a letter uh, starts closest to Z will act as the facilitator and we'll tell you, uh, show the questions that you'll be asking. And the facilitator will ask the group members the questions and listen actively to what's shared at their first and second questions. Um, the person whose first name begins with the letter closest to A will be the note taker. And the note taker will take the notes about the responses shared in the small group and be sure to post those responses in the Jamboard. So remember, and as we saw with these other ones, it's sort of everybody's putting uh, the little notes in there. And so just like you did before, just kind of separate them out so that we can kind of see them. Um, again, you're going to click to the second page of that Jamboard. Uh, and then you'll have 10 minutes. Uh, for uh, this act, this part of the activity, we'll um, give you a five minute warning so that you know to switch to the second question so that we you get to both questions. Um, captioning will be available in room one only. If you need captioning and are assigned to a group other than room one, please stay in the main room and send a chat to panelists letting us know that you'll be in room one. Oops. Okay, let's see if we can. Yeah, so the, these are the two questions you want to discuss with your group. The so what question is, what have you found increases engagement? And the now what question is, what, what is one tip, tool, or suggestion you have for online meeting engagement? The note taker, whoever's name begins closest letter A, will record your group's responses on the Jamboard. We posted a link to the Jamboard in the chat. So, so click into that if you've closed out of it. All right, you're off. Good luck. We'll see you back in 10. For everybody to get back. I hope you're able to get practice with the two experiential learning cycles. We were watching the Jamboard and it was getting populated, looking really good. Um, and we thought this topic of how people feel challenged by online meetings was a great one to use. Um, so for those of you just re-entering, thank you for participating in the breakout. Hope you had some really interesting conversations. All right, do we have everyone? Well, still, still 
from the buffer. For joining yeah. us. Yep. Five seconds. For joining left. us. Yep. I know sometimes it's hard to <laughs> leave those rooms. Thank you, everybody, for um, uh, participating in those breakout groups. It's always kind of fun to get to talk to other leaders. I hope that you find that too. Um, and now it looks like folks are returning. We have, I think we have everybody. Is that what it looks like to you, Mike? Yeah, I think we're, we're yes, I think we're all back. Super, thank you all for coming back. Let's uh, briefly take a look at that Jamboard. Yeah. There, yeah, a lot of um, good tips here, Bethany. Um, you know, ensuring everyone has the opportunity to speak. Oh, I love the, that's right. We're going to screen share this. Love it. Great. Yeah, asking questions is a very good idea. Uh, oh, having meetings at around 10 a.m. Imagine people have different preferences on that one. That one works really well for me, but um, yeah. probably gauge your audience, right? Like, uh, make making connection to the topic and audience, establish rapport, uh, having to answer interactively or keep your camera on. Not at lunchtime. Not back to back on Mondays, please. Don't have Friday late afternoon meetings. Yeah, anymore. I think we've got like maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, and some of Thursday. And <laughs> like I'm ready to I'm either ready to start my meeting, my week going over the to-do lists or end my week to get on to my weekend. Huh? Uh, these are uh, thank you, everyone. Um I, I did want to make sure to get uh some of the tips that I have for you. Some of them are really reflected here. Um, but mm -hmm. maybe we could move on to um Mike's tips for online meeting engagement. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks for getting the groups to come up with ideas on how to increase engagement in the online space. I'd like to leave you to a, a couple tips and suggestions that I've learned over the years that might be useful to you. Uh, use the experiential learning cycle we just practiced. It, it really does, I find the cycle really helps greatly with increasing folks' engagement as it helps them warm up and kind of follows that experiential learning cycle. Um, next, get vo folks' voices in the room in the first five minutes. It models their voice is important to you and that they're being expected to be engaged in the meeting. Mix up use of chat, verbal response, edible, Google Doc, whiteboards, Jamboards. Use breakouts when you want to have people discuss something, learn from each other, or generate ideas or solutions. Some tasks really benefit from small group discussion, so consider when breakouts might be a good choice. And then next, incorporate the one, two, four, all approach. One means time for self-reflection. Two means pair share. And then four is putting two paired groups together to make a group of four so they can share out what's coming up. Then you come back to the large group. It really improves engagement. And then ask one question at a time. I find sometimes facilitators will ask a bunch of questions at once and the group just doesn't know what to do with it. So ask one question at a time so people know where to focus. Then give them time to think and respond. Okay, we're gonna to touch back on content neutrality briefly before we wrap up, and real briefly as I notice the clock. Uh, so I wanna leave you with a couple more thoughts about content neutrality. Uh, there is an important distinction between content neutrality and caring about challenging oppression and working for justice. Uh, sometimes I do need to interrupt this facilitator to make sure we have equitable spaces in our meetings. So we have one more chat question question is, how do you maintain content, content neutrality while also holding a just and inclusive space? So meaning a space where all voices get heard and engaged in decision making across race, class, gender, ability, and other identities. To so make sure uh, folks can see your responses, please select everybody before you hit enter. We'll have to, you have to think quickly on this one. <laughs> so, so we can, uh, so how do you maintain content neutrality? Love to get a couple responses in that chat. I know we're coming to the top of our quick. Don't give your opinion. Yeah, going back to that, you know, original tip, right? People are intent be intentional. Thank you. Encourage all to answer. Think before you speak. All great tips. Thank you. Um, So sometimes I do need to interrupt as a facilitator to make sure we have equitable and inclusive spaces in our meetings. I wanna to ask to go ahead and advance the slide, just noticing our time and keep those chat coming. 
Um, so there are a couple ways to approach this. There are statements that call out an offensive or oppressive comment when it's made in the meetings, and then there are ones that call them out and take a curiosity approach. So some that I might use are, I find X offensive, that's not okay with me, or I'm not comfortable with that. I personally like to take a curiosity approach with something like, can you tell me what you meant when you said dot, 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 or I didn't realize you thought that, can you help me understand your thinking? Often that'll be enough for the person to recognize that what they said was offensive and give them the opportunity to apologize or clarify if I heard them wrong. And next I'd like to share some recommendations if you're interested in continuing to explore how to facilitate meetings. Uh, you'll see um, a couple of specific recommendations. The Art of Facilitation by Dale Hunter is excellent, pretty quick read and very good overview of facilitation. It's also one you can find easily online. Next, the Art of Focus Conversation. It actually has scripted conversations in it that you'll see or using the what, gut, so what, now what approach that I reviewed with you. Also, you can find that online easily. Uh, since those first two books are, that I, they love are a little older, I wanted to give you one newer one that I also love. The last one on the slide, or I guess it's actually top of your slide, was authored by Adrian Marie Brown. Maybe we have some fans of her in here called Holding Change. Excellent, excellent book. Um, thank you. Amen. Okay, so we're going to get to your questions. Well, no, we maybe not. Please put those in the <laughs> chat. We can stay a little bit after if, if uh, there are questions. We're going to get, um, we'd like to get your questions to in a moment, but we'd like to have you complete a short evaluation of this webinar because your feedback is super important to us. And, and we want to make sure we're making these sessions most useful for you and other leaders. So you'll see a link in the chat. Um, so please take a few moments to, to fill that out. Really appreciate that. Um, and then if we do have, sorry, yeah, sorry, I know folks are running up against their next meeting. Um, really quickly, we're going to be doing a webinar next month on planning for sustainability. We're working on that one right now, so it's very top of mind. Um, that's just going to be happening December 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, so watch your inbox for that. And I'd like to thank our presenter, Mike Beebe, for sharing with us today, and also the great team that, that uh, supports this, uh, which is uh, Andy King. Uh, instructional designers, Elizabeth Boyd and Matthew Lafferty, our producer, Stephanie Natoli, as well as Misty um, Thompson, who have helped us in, uh, in this webinar today. So uh, thank you so much. And we hope you had a really good experience with this webinar. Um, yeah, thank you for participating. And it's been a pleasure uh, to have you in this group today. And so this concludes today's webinar with a thank you. And yeah, I can hang for a moment if anybody has a burning question they, they want to ask, mm -hmm. but thank you all.